Hey everyone, welcome to AP Daily Live. I'm super glad that you're here and joining us. My name is Lisa Bagley and I'm going to be your instructor for the first four videos. We're going to be talking about um, getting ready for the exam. So just a little bit about me. I'm from Texas. I work in Mesquite ISD at West Mesquite High School. Whoop, whoop. And I want to just give a shout out to all my AP environmental science uh, friends and neighbors and especially my AP environmental science ladies tribe. Thanks so much for joining tonight. Let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to learn today. In this video, AP Daily Live video one, we're gonna discuss how these daily review videos can help you prepare for the AP Environmental Science exam, talk about the paper and pencil and the digital testing formats, including key dates and digital exam specifics, Conduct a brief overview of the content for Unit 1, which is Ecosystems, and Unit 2, which is Biodiversity. Discuss the science practices that are tested in AP Environmental Science and how to demonstrate your content knowledge through the science practices on the exam. This is key. We'll also model answers for two free response questions that test both the content knowledge of units one and two and the science practices most commonly associated with those units. Finally, we'll wrap up with some questions and a link to some live practice. So let's talk about how to use these videos. AP Daily Live videos are designed to help you understand how to demonstrate your AP environmental science content knowledge via the essential science practices that the College Board expects you to know. These are not content review videos. There's going to be a little bit of content review, but these are primarily for test taking tips, strategies, and how to get your maximum score. However, the AP Daily content videos that pertain to the units discussed in each of the review videos will be referenced during the presentations. During the FRQ modeling portion of the videos, I'll point out common pitfalls that students make when answering exam questions and offer suggestions on how to avoid these to maximize your scoring potential, because of course that's what we want, right? Finally, these videos are best used in conjunction with individual review on your own time. You yourself know best what areas you need to work on. Let's talk a little bit about this year's um, exam. So there'll be three exam administrations for the 2021 AP Environmental Science exam. The first administration happens on May the 14th, and it happens at 12 p.m. or noon local time, whatever, wherever you are. It is a paper and pencil exam, and it will be taken in school. Administration two happens on Thursday, May the 27th. It's at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the United States, um, but you must select the correct time zone for your local time area. So when you're looking at like, when does that start for my area, there's a drop down, and I'm gonna show you all those links here in a minute, where you can find out exactly when that's gonna happen for you. It is a digital exam, and that exam can be taken at home or in school. Administration three is also digital. It happens on Friday, June the 11th. And again, it happens at 4 p.m. Eastern. You'll need to figure out what time that is for you locally. And it is at home or in school as well. Let's talk a little bit about exam specifics for our test. This year, it's a full length exam, my friends and neighbors. Yes, yes. Section one is your multiple choice section. There are 80 questions on section one. It lasts an hour and 30 minutes, so 90 minutes long. It is 60% of your exam score. There will be individual standalone multiple choice questions, but there's also going to be some sets. So you can have three or four sets of quantitative data. This can be data tables, charts, or graphs. These questions will primarily access Access, um, assess practice five. We're going to talk more about those science practices, but they can also assess practices one, four, six, or seven. You'll be super familiar with these by the end, promise. 
You'll also have three to four sets that include qualitative data or information from models, representations, or maps. Again, these questions will primarily assess practice two, which we'll go over here in detail in a bit, but can also assess practices one, four, or seven. Finally, you'll have two sets that include text-based sources. These questions will primarily assess practice three, but can also assess practices one, six, or seven. Something to note about these is that they're new on this year's exam. They are in practice exams, but they have not debuted live yet, so this will be their first time. Section two is your free response section. There are three questions on the free response question, and you have one hour and 10 minutes to complete that section. It is 40% of your exam score. Question one will ask you to design an investigation. Question two will ask you to analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution to that problem. Question three will ask you to analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution by doing calculations. Yay math. You will be able to use a four function with a square root scientific or graphing calculator on the exam. Let's talk a little bit about the digital exam for this year. The digital exam must be taken on a desktop or a laptop computer that runs Windows or a Mac OS or on a school managed Chromebook, not a personal Chromebook. Also, no phones. The device must have a power cord and it must be connected to the internet. The, this year's digital exam will not allow you to return to answered questions or move back and forth between unanswered questions in either the multiple choice or the FRQ sections. Once you've answered a question, you can only move forward. The exam will not include questions that can be answered with an internet search, with a textbook, with notes, with a study guide or similar material. We don't wanna give an unfair advantage to digital, digital test takers, so you won't be able to search these up. It will include security features to prevent students from collaborating, from accessing unauthorized aids or attempting to have someone else test for them. It will also be reviewed with plagiarism detection software and will be reviewed post-exam to identify if there was collaboration or use of unauthorized aids. Don't do it. Finally, no handwritten responses. If you took any last year in the emergencies um, series, you can't do that anymore. All your responses will be typed into the digital testing app, including the math for your free response questions. You'll need to type it all into the app. So here are some helpful links for exam information. So you might want to screenshot this with your phone, or you can come back once the video is posted and take a look at this. For information about exam dates and times, you'll need to head on over to the College Board. Here's your link for that. For information about specifically our exam, you'll go to the course section of AP Central and look us up. For information about the digital exam, take a look at the AP Digital Testing Guide. It is a PDF file and it's going to tell you everything you need to know. Finally, to preview the digital exam, including getting your device ready and the practice app. Hey guys, this came out on April the 8th, so you really need to get your stuff. Um, if you're taking the digital exam, get yourself ready. There's your link for that. And again, give, a, give it a screenshot or come back to it later. These are all super, super helpful links. You can of course find this via a search as well. So let's get into some content review. Remember, this is really a high level overview just to kind of get your mind situated on what we're talking about. You can always access the AP daily videos that review this content specifically. So let's talk about ecosystems. Species can interact in a variety of ways. They can compete with one another, or they can uh, live together in a symbiotic relationship. The symbiotic relationships you need to know are mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. Terrestrial biomes are classified mainly by temperature and precipitation. Similar terrestrial biomes are found at similar latitudes worldwide. However, altitude plays a role too. This happens to be a picture of chaparral or scrubland biome. Uh, those are the Tonopah Mountains in Arizona. You can see that it's 
and it looks like an arid biome there. You got some scrubland in the foreground and some mountains in the back. Aquatic biomes are classified by salinity, depth, nutrient availability, turbidity, and temperature. That's a mangrove forest in Southeast Asia. We'll talk more about mangrove forests in Unit 9. The global distribution of biomes is changing. It's dynamic. Um, it has changed in the past and it will change in the future. Matter cycles through ecosystems by way of various biotic and abiotic sources and reservoirs. Some cycles are relatively quick on the order of a couple of days, but some are very, very slow. Matter generally cycles through atmospheric, terrestrial, and aquatic phases, although there are ex some exceptions to that. The biogeochemical cycles you need to know include the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the hydrologic cycles. There's what some of those exam questions look like. That first picture up there was a topic question from nitrification. You can see that some of those steps are grayed out. You do need to know the steps of the nitrogen cycle. And the one on the bottom is the hydrologic cycle. Again, another topic question. If you look closely, you can see that we've got little letters there, A, B, C, D. And so you will need to know the processes of the hydrologic cycle. And of course, since this is AP Enviro, human actions can disrupt the natural cycling of matter in ecosystems. Hey guys, shocking, but the sun is the ultimate source of energy on Earth. Mm. Autotrophic organisms convert sunlight into organic compounds such as glucose via the process of photosynthesis, which is obviously very key. Primary productivity is the rate at which this, this conversion happens. And primary productivity varies by ecosystem. You can see here, this is a false color photo of global net primary productivity taken by NASA. There are some areas that are very, very high in net primary productivity. I'm looking at you, Amazon. But then there are some areas that are pretty low. Take a look at the uh, Saharan area, very, very low in net primary productivity. Biomes, both aquatic and terrestrial, have differing rates of primary productivity. The amount of energy that can be transferred through the trophic levels of an ecosystem depends on the rate of primary productivity in that ecosystem. We're going to talk more about energy transfer here in just a sec. There we go. About 10% of energy in any trophic level is passed on to the next level. We call this the 10% rule. Food webs show that flow of energy and the flow of nutrients in an ecosystem. Organisms in a food web are classified by their feeding level, whether they're primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, as well as their source of nutrition. For instance, are they um, autotrophs? Are they heterotrophs? That kind of stuff. Food webs, of course, are dynamic and they can be disrupted by a variety of factors. Uh, changes in species biodiversity will definitely change your food web. There's a wonderful uh, energy flow in a food chain. You can see that the, the energy goes up the food chain to the top level consumer, but it all ends up getting recycled by our fungi. And of course, our wonderful sea stars are predators in rocky tidal pools in the Pacific Northwest. The higher the biodiversity of an ecosystem, the better it can withstand disruptions and stressors. Biodiversity can be measured at various levels, and this includes genetic biodiversity, species biodiversity, and habitat biodiversity. You do need to know all three of those for this course. Habitat loss, of course, is a major cause for loss of biodiversity. And again, that's a common theme throughout the course. We'll pick it up again in later chapters. Intact ecosystems provide humans with a variety of services, and these include provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. You will need to know examples of those and um, what different intact ecosystems can provide for humans, so be sure to review that. Finally, of course, human activities can disrupt ecosystem services, and these disruptions can cause environmental, economic, or cultural consequences. Make sure that if you read a prompt, you know which one you're speaking to. Island biogeography is the study of ecological relationships in isolated environments. Now these can be actual islands like off the coast of a mainland, or they can be habitat islands 
like this, where we have a habitat that was once intact and it's been fragmented. Um, in this particular picture, you can see there's been deforestation. There's also roadways cutting across this habitat. This makes um, the movement of species within this habitat difficult and leads to these habitat islands. The colonization of isolated habitats varies depending on various factors. These include the island's distance from the colonizing source or from where the main part of the population actually is, the resources and the amount of resources available, and the niche space availability. Many island species are niche specialists. They're highly specialized and they are at high risk of extinction when the ecosystem is disrupted. This is just a picture of adaptive radiation, which happens in isolated environments. Um, and that is something that you will need to take a look at. Species have a limited range of abiotic conditions that they can tolerate. Outside of that range of abiotic conditions, they suffer and sometimes die. When ecosystem disruptions cause changes in abiotic conditions, the species are at risk of extinction. Ecosystem disruptions can be caused by natural phenomena, and these disruptions can actually be quite severe, like a forest fire. Of course, forest fires can be man-made as well, but they are also sometimes started naturally. Earth system processes may be periodic, they may be episodic, or they may, may, may be totally random. Climate and sea levels have fluctuated over geologic time, of course they have, and changes in climate and sea levels result in habitat changes. My, wildlife may migrate in response to natural ecosystem disruptions, and they often do. Genetic changes in species will allow them to adapt to their environment. Adaptation by way of natural selection. When an environment changes, species must adapt or they face risk of extinction. Ecological, ecological succession is a series of predictable changes in species composition and biodiversity over time. We have two flavors of succession, primary and secondary. Succession can happen, of course, after glacial retreat. Glaciers expose new abiotic conditions, and we can have primary succession after a glacial retreat. It can also happen after a volcanic eruption. This happens to be Mount St. Helens before and after its eruption. Once the, the uh, lava covers everything, we've got new abiotic conditions, primary succession can begin. Secondary succession, of course, happens um, after a disruption when soil is already present. Keystone species are those which have a significant role in determining community structure. The presence or absence of an indicator species can demonstrate the character and cleanliness of an ecosystem. We're gonna talk more about this later. Pioneer species are those that colonize abiotic environments first. So when we're talking about succession, you might see the term pioneer species. And of course, succession will affect biomass, biodiversity, and primary productivity over time. Notice that we have three key definitions here, keystone species, indicator species, and pioneer species. All of those are really important for you to know. So let's talk a little bit about these science practices that I've been talking about. There's seven of them. The College Board expects you to be able to demonstrate the skills in these science practices on the exam. Practice number one is concept explanation. This is um, where we expect you to explain environmental concepts, processes, and models that are presented in a written format. That's a textual format. So we're not talking graphs or models here, but writ something written. Practice number two is visual representations, where you're expected to analyze visual representations of environmental concepts and processes. You'd see some models in this one or some diagrams. Practice number three is that new one where we have text analysis. It's assessed only via the multiple choice um, and it's gonna be new on this year's exam. You're expected to read and analyze sources of information about environmental issues and understand what's going on there. Answer some multiple choice questions about that. 
Practice number four is scientific experiments. We're going to analyze research studies that test environmental principles. And of course, you'll also be expected to maybe um, enhance that, talk about ways it can be improved or stuff, stuff along those lines. Practice number five is data analysis. We're going to give you quantitative data represented in tables, graphs, or charts, and you'll be expected to analyze that. We'll practice this a lot. Practice number six is mathematical routines. You're going to apply quantitative methods to address environmental concepts. You're, that's, this is the math stuff. Practice number seven, finally, is environmental solutions. There's a lot of practice seven on the exam, guys. You're going to propose and justify solutions to environmental problems. And of course, this is a biggie, so we'll practice it a lot too. So just a note here, science practices often lend themselves to certain units, like certain units kind of go along with certain um, with certain science practices, but any practice can be assessed in any unit. So it's fair game um, what, we, what we ask you. All right, you guys ready to get into the meat and potatoes? Let's do it. Free response, model question number one. The Yukon Delta in Alaska is one of the warmest areas in the Arctic tundra. Common species of flora include lichens, bryophytes, and mosses. Other flora, such as grasses, sedges, and shrubs are also present. Sedges are grass-like plant species. Tundra fires are common in the Yukon Delta of Alaska. Scientists collected data on vegetation ground cover in plots along 50 meter transect lines. The percentage of the ground covered by different types of vegetation, or in cases with no vegetation, the bare ground surface, was calculated in unburned plots, as well as several plots that had experienced fire. There's your setup. So some questions to ask as you read this. What biome does the prompt mention? Bink the Arctic tundra. What producers are mentioned in the prompt? Lichens, bryophytes and mosses, grasses, sedges and shrubs. What do you know about those producers? Anything? What clue does the prompt give you about the natural ecosystem disruption that's happening in this biome? Tundra fires. Finally, what are the science scientists measuring in their data collection? They're measuring the percentage of ground covered by different types of vegetation. And then what are they comparing? They're comparing unburned plots as well as plots that had experienced fire. All right, so here's our wonderful um, data that we need to look at. There's a lot going on here, so let's take it apart. When I look at data like this, the first thing that I tell people is, okay, let's figure out what data is shown on your x-axis. If you take a look here, we've got the number of years since the fire. So we've got unburned and then we've got 46, 32, 12, and two. What about the y-axis? The y-axis is percent cover. This is a stacked bar graph. So these, are, these can be visually difficult to look at. So what's the independent and the dependent variable? Um, if you're taking a look here, your independent variable is of course gonna be on your x-axis and you're dependent on your y. So um, just know how that setup's gonna work. Um, and this is one of the things we'll talk about at the end is like things to review in terms of scientific um, experiments. What might our control be here? Hmm. Take a look at what the control is. Maybe the control is closest to our normal conditions. We'll talk, talk more about that later. And then can you visualize how each key item shown changes over time? When I look at a stacked bar, it's visually can be a little bit overwhelming. One of the things I like to do is to take a step back and to just look at the patterns that are happening there. So for instance, I can see here that this hash marked um, up here is uh, for my unburned, it goes you know, down to a, a, a much larger percentage um, and then kind of comes back up. So I can look more at that data. The same is true with each one of these um, stacked bar areas. So get an overall kind of picture in your mind about what's happening with this data. And then you can take a look at that key and match it up. All right, little tiny um, uh, preview of that, that um, 
graph right there so that we can answer these questions. Part A is asking you to say, based on the information in the graph, identify the percent of cover for the mosses in the unburned plot. So first off, we need to find the, our unburned plot. There she blows, right? Now we need to find our mosses. Our mosses are our um, polka dotted type, right? Now let's look and find our mosses there in our stacked bar. All right. Now, stacked bars are interesting because you have to um, kind of figure out what that percentage is when looking at it. So that little part goes from about 50 to, I don't know, about 55 percent. So it's going to be a 5 percent little wedge. And sure enough, three, about 3 to 6 percent would be an acceptable uh, range of answers for that. Part B, based on the information in the graph, identify the dominant ground cover in the plot where a fire occurred 32 years before the data were collected. Well, there's our 32 years, okay? And when we look at that, we want the predominant ground cover. So my predominant ground cover happens to be that hash, that leftwards hash. So what is that? Well, looking down, it's shrubs. And so the answer to that is shrubs, all right? Pretty straightforward data analysis question. Part C, based on the information in the graph, describe the percent coverage of sedges and grasses in the unburned plot compared to the plot that burned most recently. All right, so we know where the unburned plot is. So now I gotta figure out um, which one burned most recently. All right, it's our two years. It's over here on the left, on the far right-hand side. And now we have to find sedges and grasses, which is our um, solid gray area. There it is. You can see I've circled both of those um, between our unburned and our and our two years most recently burned portion. And compared to the unburned plot, there is a slightly lower percentage of sedges and grasses in the plot burned two years ago. So it's about 15 to 18 percent in the unburned and about 10 to 12 in the most recently burned area. All right. So what what science practice did parts A through C on this question assess? Yeah, that's right, science practice five, which was data analysis. Same wonderful stimulus, let's go. A researcher hypothesizes that in the Alaskan tundra area in the study, shrubs will dominate the landscape in later successional stages. We're gonna make a claim based on the evidence in the graph to support or refute this hypothesis. Again, we are actually analyzing data here. Uh, we're gonna take a look at this and we actually have to link our claim back to what we see in the graph. So things to consider. If you don't link your claim to your evidence in your graph, Eh, zero. Number two, what trends do you observe with regard to the prevalence of shrubs from the areas that are recently burned to the areas that are burned many years ago or even the unburned plot? Here we go. In the unburned plot, which is closest to the normal condition, the percentage of lichens is highest. So take a look at this. Lichens is highest here in our unburned plot, not shrubs. The percentage of shrub cover, shrub cover is actually highest in the plot that was 32 years from the time of the last burning, but it declines in the plot 46 years from the time of last burning and declines again in our unburned plot. So the hypothesis that the researcher was talking about, it should be refuted since the data shown in the graph doesn't support this. So notice that we talked about the data that we see in the graph, and we linked it to whether or not the hypothesis should be supported or refuted. Lichen have become extinct in large areas since the Industrial Revolution. Lichen are sensitive to sulfur dioxide because they can quickly and efficiently absorb the sulfur from the atmosphere. Describe how lichen could be used as an environmental indicator species. Think back to what we just reviewed. To determine if an area has high levels of acid precipitation. So this is concept explanation. Things to consider when answering this question. What do you know about indicator species? Why does the prompt reference the industrial revolution and sulfur dioxide? And what's the connection between sulfur dioxide and acidic precipitation? Well, acidic precipitation can be formed from sulfur dioxide 
reacting with water vapor in the air to form sulfuric acid. This, of course, often happens from coal burning power plants. Lichens are sensitive to sulfur dioxide, and the relative abundance of lichens or a decline in lichen species in an area can help determine if an area has high levels of acidic precipitation. This, yeah, we're, we're still going, guys. Much of the Arctic soil is frozen year-round. Scientists measured soil thaw depth in areas that were burned at the, in the Arctic at five-meter intervals. Additionally, the thickness of the surface organic layer was measured at each site. Here's your data, okay? Some of that data looks similar to what we were seeing a little bit before, um, and some of it's a little bit different. We've got our um, average thaw depth in centimeters and our average surface organic uh, thickness in centimeters, and we've got unburned 46, 32, and 12. Identify the independent variable in this investigation. So the independent variable, right, in this investigation is going to be the number of years since the last fire. And hint, hint, it's the same as in our original graph. Um, if you want more information on this, this would be in topic 1.1, video 3. Same exact prompt, same exact data, but a new question. Identify one variable that was not mentioned in the description above that could affect the results of this investigation. And again, we are still in scientific investigations. So one of the things that's not mentioned here is what temperature was it when we made these measurements? What about the amount of moisture or precipitation, the amount of sunlight? The altitude, remember that things that climate varies with altitude, the location being examined, it doesn't say anything about that. Was it close to shore or was it inland? And the intensity of the original fire, more intense fires might produce different, uh, different results than less intense fires. Any of those would have worked. Same prompt, same data, new question. Describe the relationship between the average thaw depth and the time since the last fire. All right, so let's like get a little visual on this. This is data analysis, so let's take a look here. So it looks like in our unburned plots, back to our um, time that was about, that, that was more recently burned, that average thaw depth is greater. So as the average thaw depth increases, the number of years since the last fire decreases, they're inversely related. In other words, plots that were either unburned or further away in time from a burn have a shallower average thaw depth. All right. Yeah, we're still going. Now a scientist wants to investigate how the burning of land affects nutrient levels in the soil. The scientist sets up 10 plots, each with an area of one square meter. Five plots are burned, five plots are not. Over the next year, a variety of soil tests are performed in the plots every month. Explain why the scientist would want to test for nitrate levels in the soil in the study plots. Hmm. Concept explanation, and we're talking about biogeochemical. Nitrite is a limiting nutrient, and of course, it's essential for plant growth. When we burn vegetation, it increases soil nitrate levels. So testing would allow the scientists to measure how much these levels are increased by these Arctic tundra fires. The results could help him or her determine the impact of wildfires, which are natural ecosystem disruptions, you know, on, on plant growth and succession. Notice here that an answer for, a, uh, for the verb explain or the command word explain needs to be more detailed than an answer for a verb of describe because your answer for explain should be able to answer the question why. Describing is telling what happens. Explaining is telling me why it happens. Okay, same setup different question. Soil texture also affects soil nutrient levels. Make a claim about the relative soil nutrient levels in silty loam soil compared to sandy loam soil. So we moved on to unit four, which is where our soils are. I'm going to do some concept explanation. This is topic 4.3, if you want to review that. Silt has a higher water holding capacity than sand. 
So silty loam soil is going to hold more moisture than sandy loam soil. Soils with higher water holding capacities also generally have higher nutrient levels because fewer nutrient levels are leached out of the soil by water when it flows through. <sighs> Deep breath. <laughs> that was a long one. All right, but we're going to do it again. Yay, let's practice another one. Woohoo! Here we go. Free response model question two. It's a food web. The food web illustrates the feeding relationships between organisms of a desert community found in Arizona. This is not to scale. All right, here we go. I'm going to show you this again, so that you don't need to memorize what's going on here. Um, remember that the arrows are showing the flow of energy. Based on the information in the diagram, identify a primary producer. Easy peasy lemon squeezy saguaro cactus, prickly pear cactus, brittle brush, or velvet mesquite. Based on the information in the diagram, identify two primary consumers engaged in interspecific competition. That means between species. So let's take a, a quick peek here. Um, you got a lot of choices in this one. First, identify your primary consumers. There they are, coyote included. And you're gonna take one of those uh, primary consumers, you're gonna follow the arrows back from a primary consumer to its food source. And they're gonna figure out who else uses that food source. So the one that's here to the left that would probably be my first one that hits my eyeballs is the Gila woodpecker and the wood rat. But you could choose any two of the following as well. Antelope squirrel, the wood rat, of course. Pallid winged grasshopper, red harvester ants, or the coyote. Boop. Based on the information in the diagram, describe how a decrease in the wood rat population would affect the higher trophic levels in the short term. So we're, first we need to find our wood rats. There they are, right, kind of in the center. They are a primary consumer. And we need to look at higher trophic levels, so secondary consumer and on up. So let's figure out who eats the wood rat. Well, the red-tailed hawk, the western diamondback rattlesnake, and the coyote would all decrease. But the grasshopper mouse would also decrease. Hmm, the grasshopper mouse doesn't eat the wood rat. So why would the grasshopper mouse decrease? You need to think about um, when we're talking about food sources for those higher level trophic um, creatures and um, what would happen if one of those food sources went away. All right, so what science practice did parts A through C on this question assess? Those are visual representations, visual models. All right, the velvet mesquite trees that populate the areas of southwestern Arizona are a member of the legume family. They have nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules. Explain why the velvet mesquite trees could be considered a keystone species in the desert ecosystem. This is practice one concept explanation. And remember that an explain must answer why. Content background is that a keystone species is one that, regardless of its relative abundance in an ecosystem, plays a key role in determining community structure. Okay, the first way that you could answer this is this. Nitrogen is a limiting agent for plant growth, and plants, of course, are the basis of the trophic structure in, eco in ecosystems. By fixing nitrogen, this velvet mesquite trees, the velvet mesquite trees increase the amount of soil nitrogen, which allows for more plant growth overall keystone species. But you could also answer this way. Many organisms depend on the velvet mesquite trees for survival. Lots and lots of creatures were eating parts of the velvet mesquite tree. So a decrease in those velvet mesquite trees would have a disproportionate effect on the survival of other organisms in the ecosystem. It would take away a key food resource. Either one of those would be acceptable. The semi-arid climate of Arizona poses challenges for its agriculture. Most land is used to grow crops such as alfalfa and grasses for hay, vegetables such as lettuce and cotton. To be viable, given Arizona's dry conditions, agricultural lands must be irrigated. The two major sources of irrigation water in Arizona are the Colorado River surface and groundwater. groundwater. Describe specifically why Arizona farmers may use drip irrigation over other irrigation techniques. 
All right, so this little key here with specifically why, we are not looking for why is drip irrigation great and why is other stuff bad, but specifically why these Arizona farmers were gonna use drip over other. So you must reference the climate. All right, this is topic 5.5 if you need more info on it. It's a semi-arid climate and these agricultural lands must be irrigated. We can use surface water, which is the Colorado River or groundwater resources. So two ways to answer this. In a semi-arid climate or a dry climate like Arizona, water evaporates quickly. Drip irrigation may be chosen by these Arizona farmers because it is the most efficient irrigation te uh, technique for a dry or semi-arid climate since less water is lost to evaporation. Again, specifically talking about the climate of Arizona. You could also say in a dry or semi-arid climate like Arizona, water resources are limited, and they are. Drip irrigation may be chosen by Arizona farmers because it uses less water than other methods, which reduces your water use. So again, you must specifically reference the semi-arid or dry climate. All right, given the semi-arid climate of Arizona, describe why using groundwater for the irrigation of crops may not be the best choice. Again, concept explanation. So content background, think about what you might know about precipitation and evaporation rates in semi-arid biomes. You can make some inferences here, right? Because precipitation rates are low in semi-arid biomes like Arizona, again, notice that we're talking specifically about this biome, groundwater recharge rates might be slow. Using groundwater for irrigation is going to deplete the resource because the precipitation and recharge rates are low. You could also talk about the rate of evaporation. The rate of evaporation in semi-arid climates is higher. The use of groundwater for irrigation could contribute to soil salinization because groundwater contains dissolved salts that might be left on top of the soil as the water evaporates in this climate. And again, this is um, when we're talking about soils, go on back, take a look at agriculture and um, irrigation techniques in unit five. All right, so let's, let's get into our scientific investigation. An Arizona farmer investigates the best, me the best method to control the Egyptian alfalfa weevil, which is the primary pest of alfalfa crops in Southwest Arizona. The farmer sows genetically identical alfalfa seeds on three pots of land and harvests, harvests the alfalfa for three years by using different pest control methods on each plot. On plot A, the farmer does not use any pest control methods. On plot B, the farmer ooh, excuse me, introduces a parasitic wasp that uses the alfalfa weevil as its primary host. And on plot C, the farmer uses an insecticide. The farmer, of course, records the alfalfa yields for each plot after each harvest. Identify the control group. Which one does not have any of the experimental uh, uh, investigation added to it? And that, of course, would be the one with no pesticides, which is plot A. Plot A is closest to the normal or the one that receives no experimental treatment from the researcher. That, of course, is plot A. Same setup, different question. Identify the general type of pest control method used in plot B. Again, this, we're talking scientific investigations. This is topic 5.6. Topic 5.6 is integrated pest management or pest control methods. Um, plot B, it says, uses introduces a parasitic wasp that uses the alfalfa weevil as its primary host. Hmm. That's a biological control. Plot B is using biological controls, which is a key component of IPM to help control the alfalfa weevil. Same setup, different question. If a fourth plot D were available, explain how the farmer could modify the investigation to include an additional pest control method. Well, we've got, you know, um, we've got insecticides, we've got bio biocontrols. So what else could we do? Well, we could add a physical control method like intercropping or field sanitation, even manual pest removal to the fourth field. Or 
We could try a different type of insecticide or a different biological control. Whew, times two, for sure. Thanks for keeping track. All right, so what should we take away from all this? First off, know your exam date and format. If you don't know, talk to your AP environmental science teacher and then also talk to your AP coordinator so that you've got it down and you can backwards plan for review. Digital exam takers, test your technology well in advance of your exam date and make sure you've practiced with the digital testing app. Use your AP daily content videos to help you review your content knowledge. And as you work your way through free response questions, be sure you're connecting with what you're expected to know, which is your content, with how you're expected to show what you know, which are the science practices. Careful reading of those prompts for context clues will give you a big advantage when it comes to earning those points. And remember the basic principles of scientific investigations, valid hypotheses, independent and dependent variables, control group, identifying valid research methods, and explaining modifications to experiments that might alter results. Any of these are fair game on this year's test. All right, so questions. What do you need more information on for these two units or for your exam? Where can I provide clarification? Which parts are as clear as mud, friends? Give us some feedback. Here's your Google form, there's the link. And of course, there's your wonderful QR code. Um, at the beginning of tomorrow's video, I'll answer selected submitted questions. You might get a shout out, so make sure you tell me where you're from. At the beginning of AP Daily Live video two, so be sure to same in, uh, be sure to tune in, same time, same channel. Excited to see you here. I'm gonna leave this up for just a sec so you guys have a chance to grab that QR code or grab that tiny URL. Of course, you can always come back to it. Here's a little preview for video two. We're gonna clarify, uh, we're gonna give clarifications and answers to submitted questions for AP Daily Live video one, which was today's. Um, I'm gonna talk about free response questions, some do's and don'ts. So general do's and don'ts for free response questions. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, what, what earns points and what's not gonna earn you points. We're gonna do a content review on unit three, which is populations. We're gonna do some more FRQ modeling. I know you're excited with the science practices. And of course, you'll have interactive practice for concepts in video two. Test what you got. Here you go, friends. Money time. Join the Kahoot. Test out what you know from today's video. It's a Kahoot challenge. Um, there is, a, I know it's a, it's a fairly long little URL there. There's your game pin. Zap that code. It's going to take you right to the Kahoot. I'll leave it up here for a few seconds so you have a chance to do it. Also read it out loud if you're just listening. Your game pin is 0058065385. Join my challenge. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm going to see you tomorrow.